Welcome to Behind the Smoke Podcast. My name is Sean Walchef with Cali Comfort Barbecue. We are recording above the butcher shop with Derek Marso from Valley Farm Market, and uh, we're back from our annual bye week. Annual um, bye week, and you're back from fucking Bulgaria. I'm back from Bulgaria. <laughs> so back from Bulgaria. That's exciting. How was it? Uh, Bulgaria is incredible, man. We had an amazing time with my son, my wife, uh, her brother. Um, now, her, you went back to the village your grandpa grew up in, correct? My grandfather was born in a village about two hours northeast of where uh, my wife is from. Yes. Isn't that fucking wild? Like, if you really think about that? It's incredible. I mean, I brought my son to the village that my grandfather was. So his great, great grandfather. And then you got to see his nephew. Correct. Lubin. Yeah. Correct. Mm-hmm. And uh, he's he's still going. Doing he's something. still going. Yeah. He's uh, he's battling cancer right now. Um, so it was good to spend some time with him and his wife. But yeah, it's. I mean, it's a beautiful country. So from um, door step to doorstep, how many hours? <laughs> On the way back, I didn't have the best plane flight. I no, was, it was thirty six hours of travel. Thirty six hours. Fuck. Thirty six <laughs> hours wild. of travel. Yeah, I'm over that real quick. I have like a hard time at two hours. Right. Two hours, three hours. I'm like, oh my god, man, that that flight was long. Yeah, I'm over it. It was a pilgrimage, but yeah, I'm happy to be back. Happy to be back podcasting, and you get you guys did an incredible job with Chad. Oh, him. oh, that was uh, that was a good one. Yeah, you missed I, Chad here. I, I, I he's list, just a good dude. I listened from Bulgaria. Did you? Yeah, yeah. He's a uh, he's a good dude, and uh, now we got you. We're uh, got you in the gym. So I know, I know. You got me in the MMA gym, Sean, Ten, Tenth uh, Planet Fitness. Sean was uh, working his ass off this morning and yesterday. So kudos to you. Uh, the ninety percent of it's just showing up, right? So if you want to feel like a baby or feel like you're not a man, <laughs> then work out with a former NFL athlete. <laughs> Uh, Wait no. a second. So your wife is from the same area that your family's from? She's from a, a city two hours north uh, south. And you met her in San Diego? I met her in San Diego. Now that's the that, whole that's definition the of it's a small world. Yeah. yeah, 100%. My dad and I used to have this fight all the time. And he we argued till the day he passed away about what is it. You, know, you always hear that expression, boy, it's a small world. Sure. Well, my dad grew up in Los Angeles. Comes back, moved to Nashville, Tennessee in, 90, in 77, comes back, and he sees a buddy of his he hasn't seen since high school, right in front of his high school, basically. And he turns to me and he goes, man, talk about it. it's a small world. I go, it's not a small world at all. What are you talking about? I go, when's the last time you saw him? He goes, I saw him in 1964 right here. And I said, yeah, because you graduated from the same high school. He hasn't moved away. You came back home. This is what you saw before. <laughs> a small world's on, your, you're on the other side of the world. He never understood what I was arguing about. That's so right. funny. And we would, I mean, wouldn't talk to each other for three days because I thought he was an idiot and he thought I was an idiot. And, <laughs> That's uh, and, so funny. But with your wife, it's actually, it's a, it's a small world. Yeah. No. I mean, you can, I mean, it's pretty much the furthest place from San Diego. Uh, yeah, the, I don't know if you right? can go any further. It's definitely on the other side. Like of Kansas the world. is the middle of the United States. Yeah. Like everyone's like, like you went from being in the ocean and surfing all the time to going to the state that's the furthest from the ocean in the United States for a college. And I'm yes. Like, oh, I guess that's actually, that's what I fucking did. That's what you did. <laughs> that's what I did. Yeah. And you learned a lot from it too. Oh, I mean, I, I was just talking to my, uh, my high school and they had me out and they wanted me to speak to the, the class and I was talking to them and I said, you know what, if there's ever an opportunity for you guys to get out and get away from San Diego, take that opportunity and run with it because there's nothing that made me grow up faster than going to a big 12 school in the middle of nowhere. No, nobody. I'm out. I'm in, outside my comfort zone, just very vulnerable. And I mean, I grew up more when from 18 to 19 than I did my first 18 years. And, um, you know, I talked to a kid at Monte Vista who's was getting a lot of scholarship offers and he chose Montana state. So I'm actually really him. stoked for him. And I think he's uh, going to do an amazing job out there, but <clears throat> dude, that's me and my wife. She went to Purdue. She's from Indiana. And we both said, if our kids don't get scholarships, we're, which we're not counting on, right, um, they have to either go to a Big 12 or Big 10 school. Yeah. They're not staying in San Diego. What about SCC? No. What about, what about, what about inter- <laughs> <laughs> no Definitely <chance>. no. <laughs> no chance. They what can if they pay for it. What about international? Study abroad. I don't want them going for five years. Gone. Yeah. Um, but they can go study abroad. Sure. I, I think we talked about it before. One of the biggest mistakes or regrets that I ever have is turning down NFL Europe. Yeah. You know, I was, I was angry. I got released from the Vikings. I was like, fuck that. Like, I, I don't deserve to go to NFL Europe. I'm not going to go. I'll wait till next season to get picked back up. And it's like, why the fuck was I so hard headed? And why, like, go travel and play football and like go pa- backpacking and like experience the world. Um, 
But that's one of my biggest regrets. So I think everyone should do it if they have, if they have the opportunity to do it, to go out 100%. there. 100%. Yeah, traveling uh, definitely gives you a good perspective. And I mean, for me, going to Bulgaria, such a beautiful country, but they have a lot of things that they have to deal with. You know, we talk about every village being the same. Mm -hmm. um, they have their own issues, even if they're on a micro scale. And for us, podcasting has forced us out of our comfort zone. Sure. Um, it's something that has brought us together with people kind of giving us oh shit internet moments where you reach out to people that you might follow on social and um, dig deeper and have deeper uh, connections. Uh, our guest today, Dave Palais of the Dave and Jeff podcast. Uh, we're really, really fired up to have you here. Thank you for having um, me. It's truly cool to know that somebody that's been in radio for 20 years, they're coming up on their 20 year anniversary on August 1st. Jesus. Um, Actually, 25 years for me, 20 years 25, with Jeff. 25, holy shit. 20 just with Jeff. Yeah. That's fucking impressive. I don't know if I can take 20 years with you. I'm just going to throw this out there right now. Oh, you got me 20, prepped. You, got me, you might kill me in the gym before then, but we'll see about that. But uh, yeah, give us give us a little bit of your backstory so people know um, kind of how you got into radio and how you've flip that into what you're doing now and how much totally different it is. Yeah, it's it kind of funny. Is I went to San Diego State, and I thought I was going to the University of Alabama all the way through high school. I was going to Alabama. I was going to play sports somewhere. I was looking at Alabama, Tennessee, USC to play either basketball or, or baseball. And then um, I went to go to San Diego State and make a, a – hopefully the story's not too long, but I moved away from home when I was 15 years old. Wow. So I left. My parents lived in, in Beverly Hills for 35 years. And after 35 years, they got in the car and they drove cross country. When you're 15? No, 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 no. They they did it when I was six years old. Okay. They drive from from Beverly Hills to Nashville, Tennessee, and they never came back. And it was, I always say it's the Beverly Hillbillies in reverse. <laughs> right. But they wanted a, a different lifestyle. They wanted more property. They wanted to get away from people. Traffic was getting bad in L.A. They wanted clean air. They wanted just a different lifestyle. My dad kind of wanted to get away from his family. He was supporting not only was he supporting our family, he was supporting his mother, he was supporting his sister. He was, he was tired of working his butt off as a guy that cleaned carpets in hotels. And work three days straight with no sleep and then have to divvy up the money. Sure. And he just said, you know what? This isn't the way I want to go. So he was like 27, 28 years old. And he decides we're going to move to Nashville. And my parents loved it. Never moved back. And my family's still back there. At 15, Nashville wasn't for me. And so actually I got into a fight with a football coach. And once I got in a fight <laughs> with a football coach... Um, and it was, it was, it was a bad fight. It was one of those where the football coach lost a testicle. It was a bad fight where oh, I wow. couldn't. No I, way. Yeah. I threw a football into him as hard as I could. Holy and, shit. And, uh, his testicle ruptured. And that was it for me at that school, basically. <laughs> what was it over? What did he want you to do? Um, I got in a fight with the uh, best player on the team in the locker room and I broke his leg in the fight. <laughs> and that guy's actually breaking legs, breaking legs, yeah. ripping, testicles. ripping testicles. Well, that guy was actually, <laughs> that guy's actually my best friend to this day. We never, we never talked about it either. But I ended up breaking his shin. I snapped his shin no in, uh, in, the, in the locker room, and he couldn't play. So the football coach was pissed, set me up as the guy that, we're going to beat the shit out of you. So I was a quarterback, but then they put me in as a running back in every single play for a week. They gave the ball to me. My coach played quarterback, gave the ball to me, and everybody drilled me. Even the offensive players hit me. The offensive players, defense players, that whole deal, my spine was showing through my skin. It was bad. It was a bad deal where I couldn't go to the school anymore To once my freshman year ended. My choice was either go to an all-boys school or come out to Los Angeles and live with my grandmother. And so I come out to uh, come out to L.A. So without a doubt, I'm going to L.A. I used to come here all the time for summer, summer vacation, and we drive down to San Diego all the time with my family. And I said, man, I love Southern California. Even though I thought I was going to end up going to, to Alabama, I ended up going to San Diego State, visited a close friend that was down here for two years, loved it. I loved it, too. As soon as you come to San Diego State and see San Diego, you're sure. like, dude, I'm not leaving. Not going to Tuscaloosa. And so I didn't, I didn't know any better. So I went to play baseball at San Diego State. And when I found out I wasn't starting as a freshman, I was like, go fuck yourself. To coach, you know, to coach Deeds. Like, you had to talk about it. You had a chip on your am? shoulder. Well, I didn't know any better. It's, it's like growing up. You know, it, yeah, it's sure. one of those things. And I always say at, at 18, I was the smartest guy on the planet. In my 40s, I don't know shit. You yeah. know, and, and I just didn't have anyone to direct me. So I get engaged my freshman year. Still married, which I don't recommend anyone. Don't get engaged with freshman year college. It worked out for wow. me. Wow. Wow. That's so amazing. So at, at 19, uh, yeah, I know exactly who I'm getting married to. At 22, I have my first son. And I'm like, holy shit, I'm lost without sports. What do I do? 
and I listened to 690, like so many of us did. I listened sure. to Extra Sports 690, and I loved Steve Mason's show. And Steve Mason had the night show, came on after Hacksaw. And I started interning, and I mean, I loved it. And you ever see the movie Private Parts with Howard Stern? Yeah. yeah Do you remember the scene where his dad takes him in, he's a little boy, and Symphony sits there, and he turns the mic on, and the look on his face, I'm telling you, that was me. I yeah. was hooked. Yeah. As soon as I saw how radio worked, I was like, man, I'm in. And Steve Mason was, was great. At the time, he worked with Rick Schwartz, and the show was funny. It was a long show. It was like five hours every night. Fuck. And Mason would admit, who's still on in L.A. with John Ireland, he said, I don't know a lot of things. I don't know. And so whenever a caller would call in and go, Steve, what do you think about the Chicago Bears? What do you think of the Chicago Bears? And then he would <laughs> feed off of that because he couldn't tell you anybody on the Chicago Bears. That's mm-hmm. funny. And then he'd have me prank Hacksaw before his show started. And we'd play it back. And it was funny as shit. Because right. Hacksaw will never admit he doesn't know anything. Right. And so so he would say, and so you know, he'd write out, what do you want me to say? And I'd say, Hacksaw, I hear the Dodgers are looking at a second baseman and win one soon. What do you think? And Hacksaw, yeah, great player. 272, stole 32 stolen bases. Completely good bullshit stats. Right. No guy named win one soon. And then we'd play it back and we'd laugh at Hacksaw. And so I was like, man, I'm hooked. I'm like, this is fantastic. And. It's one of those things, Sean, you were talking about how just showing up, showing up to work, showing up to work out. Well, I was around that radio station as much as I could. Had a, had a son that was born right around the time my internship started. And I was in 690 and the phone rang one day and there's nobody in the building. And it was ESPN saying, we need somebody to cover the, the Braves um, Padres game. And I was like, well, there's no one here. And they go, you want to do it? I said, yeah, I'll do it. So basically, call in three times an hour, give updates, go get do an interview, tape it, send the interview back to Connecticut. And they're like, hey, you're really good. Do you want to do it again? I said, yeah, I'll do it Shit, again. Yeah. That turned into a whole season, turned wow. into years. Wow. Then I said, hey, do you have anyone that does this for the Lakers? I'm a huge Laker fan. And they said, nope. And they said, you want to do it? Will you drive to LA every day? And I said, I'll drive to LA every game. Did the Lakers for 10 years. That's I did the Clippers for amazing. 10 years. I loved it. Didn't pay well, but sure. man, it was my foot in the door. It was national radio. It was it was awesome, and so I got to meet Kobe when he was seventeen, you know, right. and, and and I got to be around the guys that I loved. Sat right behind Chick Hearn for every day of work. It was really cool. It was it was it was awesome getting to know Tony Gwynn. And to be honest with you, if it wasn't for Tony Gwynn, I wouldn't have lasted this long because so many guys would tell you, "Hey, do you have baseball players are the worst? Do you have a second to talk?" And they would say, "Hey, go fuck yourself." <laughs> and Tony said, "The reason you're messing this up is." You can't say, Mr. So-and-so, Mr. Votto, do you have a second to talk? It has to be Joey. you got to put yourself on their level. Otherwise, they think that you're green. Right. And so I couldn't get guys. A lot of times, every day, Tony would do an interview with me. Every single day. And he was the best hitter in baseball. And ESPN's like, you only send the same guy every day. But fuck it. He's the best hitter in baseball. <laughs> right, we'll let you keep going. Yeah. And it started to work out. Tony kind of held my hand to meet different guys and, and you know, Ken Griffey Jr. And Stan Musial, when he would come to town as just a, just a guy. Hall of Famers, and, and Tony would always introduce me, and he set me up. If it wasn't for Tony, honestly, I wouldn't have lasted this long. Wow. So we got into, uh, I was wanting to do a talk show, and um, I was doing Laker reports for KFMB. Jeff was producing Hank Bauer's show, and Jeff was on the other side. We didn't really know each other except I'd call in. He'd answer the phone. He'd put me on there. And then Dave Sniff, the program director, says, man, you guys seem like you get along great. How about doing a weekend show? And did it, you actually get along great? Like, were you friends we did. at the I time? Mean, yeah. When I mean, you guys called in? It was, it yeah, I just... called in. Just, he, Jeff would make you laugh. Everything Jeff does makes you laugh. <laughs> right. I mean, Jeff's funny as shit. <laughs> right. And so we, we got along great. I was more the, the straight guy, and Jeff was funny as shit. So I'd walk in with 15 pages of notes, and Jeff would walk in <laughs> and nothing. But Jeff is best that way. I'm best that way. I'm, right. I'm one of those things. I don't, I don't like surprises. But Jeff, you just put it on the tee and he hits a home run. And right. he's one of those guys, if you soft toss it to him, he's going to do great every single time. And we just had a great connection. All of a sudden, August 1st, 1998, we're doing our first show at um, Qualcomm Stadium. At the time, it wasn't Qualcomm, but it was our first guest, like Ryan Leaf. You so know, it, it was Kevin Gilbride. Yeah. And all of a sudden, we're doing a show in front of Charger fans, 15,000, 20,000 people. And it just, boom, took off. Um, pre- and post-game shows. To, we got lucky in 98 where the Padres made the run in the World Series. And we're doing World Series post-game talk. And it was it was a lot of fun. But that kind of started our relationship. You know, we're, we're best of friends. And very it, it's really rare that guys that work with each other every day are actually close off there. You just, you don't yeah. see that very often. Right. And which surprised me in radio. How many guys stabbed each other in the back? Um, we've never had that situation. So, we're you know, we've always been extremely close. And we've gone... Station to station to station to station, and basically a few national shows, and 
Uh, we were at Sporting News. We were at Fox Sports. And I still work with ESPN and Sirius NFL Radio covering the Chargers. And uh, we've maintained this. So now here we are, podcast-wise. Things, when we left 1360, Jeff was ready to go. He was ready yeah. to go a long time ago. He didn't care for the way management treated him as a person. Not as a, an employee, but more so he went through some bad things in his life. When his wife's best friend passed away, his best friend passed away. And then they wouldn't basically understand or give him time to grieve. And he's like, I'm out of here, man. I can't wait to get the fuck out of here. And I thought Jeff was going to walk out in January of 2016. And he, he laid th- down all the way through for me. Thank goodness, because I had a kid in school. Yeah. And um, we, as soon as we were done in August of 2016, he said, uh, man, I'm done. And I said, let's do the podcast. I said, this is the future. I'm telling you, this is the way things are going. The podcast is the way... People are getting out there. Look what Adam Carolla does. Adam Carolla was our morning show when we were on CBS here in town at 103.7. And so the guy's making $70 million a year doing his podcast. I go, we can talk about whatever we want. We can swear. We can have whoever on we want. There's no one to answer to but ourselves. Let's just find our own advertisers and do this podcast. And he fought it for a while. And then when the Chargers left on January 12th, 2017... He's like, you know, let's go ahead. Let's give it a shot. And ever since then, he, he loves doing it. I love doing it. I'm sure you guys, you know, I mean, love the fact that we no one's saying pod- we'd have to have a show meeting afterwards. We wouldn't be right. podcasting today if it wasn't for your guys' podcast. Oh, that's cool. I mean, literally listening to what the transformation that you guys took from going from radio to what you were able to do on the podcast platform because you had no restrictions. You had nobody that was pushing an agenda. You had nobody that told you, hey, this is what you have to talk about. It was literally you and Jeff opening up and telling us what the fuck actually was going on. I appreciate that. I I appreciate it. Again, a lot of people can do it. It's a great way to, you know, everyone has an opinion, has a thought. Can you do it seem, seem engaging to the audience? You know, Colin Coward makes a great point when he says, they don't pay me to be right. They pay me to have an opinion. Right. Someone's going to eventually like your opinion or want to fight with your opinion. Sure. But it, the, the deal is, you know, you have that you have an opinion and can you go? And a lot of times management is the one that kind of directs you. They made us at 1360 the last year we were there talk nothing about except the stadium issue. Fuck. Every single day is a stadium issue. And we'd always argue back and say, you don't understand. This is what we already have those people on our side. Everyone who's listening right now wants, wants the charges to stay. Yeah. Why do we have to keep beating them with the same thing? It, they weren't going to change anyone's mind. That we already have that 100%. side. And when we'd argue this with management all the time, they go, what do you want to talk about? I go, we want to talk about players. We want to talk about games. We want to talk about what's going on. What makes sports fun? No, no there's not a kid out there that sits there and have a conversation in his front yard talking about the stadium issue with his, you know, eight-year-old buddy. That's that, not that what it's about. That would be me. I, I was that one fucking kid. <laughs> you're that guy. But you want to make kid. sure that you're relative. And, and yeah. people... Th- the audience can feel your enthusiasm. So if you had to talk about the same shit every single day, every damn day, you're not gonna you're not gonna have that motivation to be talking and be, you know be excited about it. Oh my so gosh! If you can talk about something that you're truly excited about, yeah, don't kid yourself. Whoever's listening can fucking feel that. Yeah, and that's what I, that's why they want to keep listening and do that stuff. So for podcasts for Sean and I, it's like man, the best thing that's happened to us is that we've had opportunities to have sponsors to do things. We're just not there yet. We just want to be able to do our do our thing. Yeah. You know, we're not going to make any money off it right now. At some point, we'll, we'll, there will be a, a time that it, that comes into play. But we're just excited to, to have this platform to be able to talk, share, you know, create relationships. And it's more motivating that way for us than yeah. trying to figure out how to, you know, monetize on it. Yeah, I think one of the things you, you guys talk a lot about in the podcast kind of, you know, it's a theme that runs throughout. And I, I just read a book called Be So Good They Can't Ignore You. Yeah, by, by uh, Cal Newport. And the whole principle is it's there. Steve Jobs came out the Harvard, the Stanford speech. It was follow your passion, you know, follow your passion, follow your passion. And really, this book is the antithesis of that. And it's work on your craft, you know, and that's something that for Derek and myself working in restaurants and working in butcher shops and now podcasting. If you start thinking of things as a craft and that you're working on that every single day and like you said, showing up, yeah, be so fucking good they can't ignore you, yeah. you'll find opportunities where your passion can grow. And I think what you said earlier is, you know, you didn't make any fucking money when you first started. No. You know, and it wasn't about the money, but you were working on your craft. You know, exactly right. It's, it's funny you, when you, I always tell my kids, find what makes you happy, you know, try and do what you can. That makes you happy. And, and if you're not, then you might have to fall back to something where, hey, eight hours a day, this is what I do. So break down your day into three three parts. Eight hours, i got to go to work so I can feed myself and have a place to live. Eight hours, I'm going to sleep. 
and eight hours I'm going to do something that's for me and try and break it down into into three parts if you get to that point but try and find your passion my wife and I talk about this all the time sports for me was my passion mm -hmm. always I, I love sports from the time I was you know three four years old I remember my mom saying what are you going to do when you grow up I'm going to be a pro baseball player she thought I was insane but she never said no you weren't yeah and that was my goal was to chase that as long as I, I possibly could I want to be a pro athlete and then you know that obviously that doesn't work out that's how I came back into sports broadcasting because it kept me as close to the game as possible my wife is, you know, in her 40s also. She has no idea what her passion is. She never found it. You know, she's in education, and she does a great job, and she does a great job for the school district and wins a ton of awards what she's doing, but it's still not her passion that, that says this is what, uh, what makes me get up every day. And then I try and point out to her, I go, look, how many kids have you touched their lives? Have you made their lives better? Families made their lives better? You got to look at it that way, that you are changing someone's life. You're making someone's life better. This is your passion, but you don't realize it. Maybe later mm -hmm. on down the road, you're going to realize that you help families get out of a bad situation. You know, I was, I was obviously being behind a microphone or being on television. I did sat at the desk at Fox 6 for, you know, nine years. And that, that was fun. But radio is always the most fun is when people come back and they, they say, I remember when you said this, when you said that, you just don't know. I say radio is kind of like being the Philly fanatic or the San Diego chicken. <laughs> people don't know what you look like a lot. You're just inside that costume. Right. So when I did TV, I hated being recognized. I liked being able to say whatever we said, and then you could go out in the street and no one knew who you were. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to, I didn't do it for to get noticed. Neither does, does Jeff. And so my wife touches a lot more lives than, than I do, obviously. Ours is entertainment. Um, for, for her, as we have this conversation, you know, all the time, I said, how many people have you had to lay off? You always hear about school districts laying off people. She's so good with her budget. She's never had to lay anybody off. That's not incredible. a janitor, not a teacher, nobody. And I said, that you're affecting, you know, tons of families by right. doing that. Whereas us, we're doing, you know, something that's fun, more entertainment. Well, I wouldn't, I wouldn't discredit yourself. What you guys are doing is you're providing something. And that's why we love podcasting so much is you're providing a service that people want. You know, you wouldn't have a million downloads of your podcast yeah. and you wouldn't have all the people in all the heavyweights in radio. They all listen. That's why amazing. the fuck do they listen? Yeah, they listen because it's engaging, you know, because you guys are telling stories. There's people all over the world. You guys are talking about San Diego primarily, primarily but because you guys do such a good job setting up the story, bringing people in and being vulnerable, really. You know, and that's the thing that Derek and I, you know, one of our biggest things was if we're going to do this podcast we have to just let people know hey we got fuck I, I got sued by by doing things the wrong way yeah and we got to share that and we got to yeah. be we got to show hey we fucked this thing up yeah no no I, I agree with you the more real you can be the better off you're going to be i would say you know hey, can, can you sleep at night you right. know and it's one of those if you lay it out on the table it's like i got nothing to hide you know this is is kind of it i try and treat people the right way i try and live my life the right way and then you, you say, if, if I make a mistake and a lawsuit comes here and there and you say, shit, you know, you, you don't want to say I plead ignorance, but hey, nothing was malicious to fuck somebody over. Yeah. yeah. No, I, I, we talk about it with my buddies all the time, but it's like, man, I sleep well at night. And it, it, when I was like 18 years old, 19 years old, I kind of figured out like, okay, I don't need to lie about things. I don't need to fabricate things. I can just be who I am. Yeah. And that way it's easy to open up and I can express myself and not have to worry about what well, shit, what did I say over here? Then you, then that's when all of a sudden you have anxiety and you don't know like what you said. And I'm like, fuck my memories. I got beaten in the head way too many times. Anyways, I have no, I can't remember yeah. yesterday. So now it's just like, I know exactly what I said, what I did. And it's very, very easy just to be who I am. And I sleep well, because yeah. I know I'm a good person and I try to give back. I do whatever I can. Yeah. It's, that to me is extremely rewarding because I might not have done that when I was younger. I might, you know, try to exactly. fake some things or do that. Now I'm like, here I am. Yeah. If you don't like me, I get it. I'm, I'm not for everybody. I'm, yeah. I'm totally fine with that, you know. But if you do like it, right on. Keep listening. Keep hanging out. Come by the store. We'll talk. We'll chit chat. Whatever. Um, but that's that's the platform a podcast gives you too. You know, you can just open up and and be yourself. I, I can agree with you more. And the personality so you know yeah. and. The fact that, as you mentioned, that there are people in San Diego that do this for a living and, uh, you know, through terrestrial radio. I love it when St Stevie Woods, you know, responds. Fuck yeah. When Scott Kaplan responds. You know, that that's fantastic. I know the guys at 1360 can't respond. 
You know, yeah. I know they've been told they, they can't. I mean, we're still friends with all those guys over there. It's and, so stupid. And, and it, it is stupid. I mean, it might cost and I was ever running thing on Twitter and where we attack <laughs> each other. But I know Mike can't respond the way he wants to. And, right. And I ran into Nick Hardwick at a Charger game last year. And right. I was considered Nick a friend. And yeah. when I saw Nick, it was, it was like old times. Mm-hmm. And, you know, people think, was there animosity towards you guys and Nick and Judd? Not at all. Yeah. Jeff was ready to walk away. It wasn't like... We felt like, wait a second, we didn't see this coming, and we got pushed out. We went on vacation in June of 2016, and they had those guys fill in for us. We knew that was an audition that week. You know, sure. we, we knew how it was going. There's no animosity. I wish nothing but the the best for those guys. Judd's a good guy. Nick's right. a good guy. Right. I felt bad that Nick got wrapped up into something he shouldn't have got wrapped in, and he just emotion took over where I'm gonna wear the cape for San Diego and fuck Dean Spanos, and all of a sudden, shit, I want to be in the NFL still. And right. who would have blamed him? Yeah. I mean, I still drive up to. I don't work for the Chargers. I have right. nothing to do with Dean. And if the Chargers want to lose, it doesn't affect my paycheck. But there's no way I was going to end a 25-year relationship with ESPN or Sirius NFL Network because the Chargers moved. It was right. only eight attempts a, a, a year to drive up there to earn a paycheck and, yeah. and basically feed my family. And you have to look at the big picture, too. Like, you talk about what motivates you. And, you know, if you're – you know, I know Nick. I, I've known him for a while. And it's – you know, for him – he was so passionate. He just couldn't get away from it. You know, yeah. he's like, and I, and I feel the same way too. And it's taking me a lot longer because I had a lot more animosity towards football. Yeah. But it's like, I could never watch a game like a normal person watches a game. So when I got done playing, I watch a game and I'm like dissecting it. People are talking over here. I'm like, just shut the fuck up. Like, you, you have no idea what you're even talking about, you know? So now it's taken me, what is it? almost 11 years now since I've been playing that I'm actually getting to enjoy it, but I'm find that like passion inside of me yeah. again. And I'm getting like excited and like what he said, he's like, I just love being around it. Like it's, it's been a part of us for so long. You can't deny those yeah. little things. And um, so you know, I, I, I wouldn't I walk away it. from it either. If I was right. him, I understand now he's taken that, that step away, which I kind of think it's a bad year for him to do it. I mean, really they're, they're so talented. If they had Hunter Henry healthy, it would not shock me to see the chargers in the Super Bowl. And I know for San Diego fans that kills you. To hear that, but that team is talented. I mean, <laughs> I saw Sean talented. up there all the time, man. Yeah. and they were getting better and better. And they lost games by just a little bit. You, you, you think maybe they can put it around? I think so many of us are Philip Rivers fans right. that we want to see it for Philip. We right. want to see sure. him because it might keep him out of the Hall of Fame if he doesn't make that run. Right. But it's it's one of those where it kills you that they're gone, but there's still guys like Rivers that you still cheer for. It's it's really such a a strange line. There's so it's, many people in San Diego that are diehard Laker fans. But yeah. How dare you root for the Chargers? Right. I mean, yeah. I grew up in San Diego my whole life and, you know, being a sports fan, it's been such an interesting thing. I mean, I studied sociology in college once I realized I fucking hated the business schools. Yeah. Like the business classes I took, they weren't engaging. Yeah. But then I love people and I love seeing what's happening with people. Why are they doing what they're doing? And when you talk about football, I mean, that is such a unique subculture of people. And like what we were able to do at age three when we were tailgating, I mean, we built a community and we built relationships with so many people from so many different walks of life that no fucking other reason outside of football would we know them. And, you know, those are the things that I miss the most. Yeah. I mean, I miss not knowing that I'm going to see Aaron and Monica and their son and that they can't hang out in the parking lot with my, my, our new son. Yeah. Because we spent all that time with my wife there. And those are the things that really, I mean, that that's when it hits home for sure. Do you guys think it ever it ever comes back around? I mean, I've seen more and more people on Facebook all of a sudden saying, look, I gave it a year where I was trying to pick a new team. I couldn't get attached to a new team. And I'm coming back to the Chargers. Yeah, you know? absolutely. 100%. And, and I think if you can separate the Dean factor. And I think you, I think you're better off. But the NFL is, is so much fun. I mean, honestly, as I said, I've been married 26 years. If my wife didn't talk to me from Friday night till Monday morning, I'd be fine with it. I, I, I love, I love, I love college football. I'm up at five forty-five, so at six o'clock, I'm ready for Kirk Herb Street and those guys to do their thing on on the college football. I can't wait to watch Alabama football. I watch the Pac-12 football. I love it. I can't get enough college football. I, I love college football like you wouldn't believe right now. Yeah. And at the same time, I love the NFL. I mean, I can't get enough the NFL from. From morning to night, I absolutely love it. I mean, so well, the, as, again, the, if the, champ- would talk the championships also at Alabama help with your, yeah, oh, with they, your they son. Did. And my, my son being there and stuff too. It was, it was that's why I asked you about the SEC. <laughs> right, SEC football to me is just the best. But right. it's it's enough for me where I love the sport so much that I can't imagine that the people that said I'm so mad at the Spanish family, I'm going to cut off the thing that's my release. You know, yeah. Sundays have been your release. It's your escape. Yeah, I think you know, and if that is. 
what's happening with people and they, that is the release. I have a hard time believing that football is going to be around in 20 years. I really do with the concussions going on and everything. So if it is your thing, jump back on it because I, I honestly, I mean, what's California right now? They're, they're getting close to banning pop Warner, right? It's, well, it's, it's, yeah, it's uh, full. I, 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 you're, you're, you're absolutely it, right. But yeah, you're right. It's funny you say the 20 years. I, I say this all the time too. I don't know how the hell football is still legal in public schools. Yeah. Because you see this whole CTE thing going on that all of a sudden these lawsuits going on and the kid at Washington State, you found out he had the brain of a 60-something-year-old man and who, who committed suicide. And I'm going, how in public schools is this shit still going on? Because right. lawsuits are coming yeah. to school districts and everywhere else. And the state of California is is dying already. You're going to deal with lawsuits up and down the coast because yeah. you know they're coming from these kids. My, my youngest son is at... 17 years old was 325, six foot three, and big as hell. Look, he was bigger than Slauson from the Chargers, and he wanted to be an offensive lineman more than anything. By his senior year, he played his first game, his senior year, and he just said, I can't go anymore. He said, I've had so many concussions, and he, he I said, I've seen it. I mean, his, everyone's helmet was black. His The paint was knocked off every single week. Mm-hmm. And I said, how much are you using your head? And then we figured out the guy's probably had like 26 concussions. Yeah. And so we're going, he can't play. Now he has to change his entire body. It wasn't healthy for him. And still to this time, we wonder, is this kid ever going to bounce back to being where his brain should be? It's scary. I mean, to talk about it, I, I'm i in the process right now. I've been getting MRIs I've been, yeah. to make sure I have a baseline of where I'm at. And it's scary. I had eight documented concussions, which, which means I probably had over 100, right? Yeah. The ones that I was like, oh, you can kind of taste it, but you just kind of like close one eye a little bit and kind of go back out there and, and make sure you do it. It's it's extremely scary. People talk like I have three sons and they're like, are, you know, do you want them to play football? I'm like, absolutely not. I, I do not want them to play football. I don't football. want my, my grandsons playing football If they choose to play, I, that's that's their choice. But never am I going to put them in football. I'm never going to put them. If they want to play. I, don't, I only played in high school, so yeah. I, I didn't play Pop Warner. I was too fat. Uh, they have so, a weight thing. Yeah, yeah I didn't tell what you're talking they, about. They have a they have a weight thing here. So it was um, you know great for me to play in high school, um, but man, I, wrestling was the best sport I ever did. Yeah, one hundred percent. There's no sport that taught me more about myself than wrestling. So I want them to wrestle. I want them to play baseball. And I want them to fucking golf. Yeah, you know what I mean. Yeah. Like you can golf from the time you're yeah. eight years old till you're ninety. Yeah. So like get them in something they they understand and they can they can play forever. And if they do play football. David Ben, you're getting a phone call because I want them to yeah. long snap. Yeah. Play play four plays a game and, and get go. paid some money. Like, I'm, <laughs> no, it's, I'm a, into that. it's a great call. Again, we had a son who played all the way up into, into college football. And I would say to my wife, I said, man, I get so nervous. I mean, when it comes to high school Friday nights, which is fantastic. Mm-hmm. But, man, I couldn't work on Fridays. I couldn't do anything. I told my wife, don't even call me. I was yeah. be so nervous. People thinking, but I don't want to let him know I was nervous. Mm-hmm. Nobody took a hit like my son. He didn't know how to take a hit. He never played football. He took it flush, never took it on the side. He just <laughs> took a beating, man. And, and if you ask John McFadden, who's the head coach at Eastlake High School, will say, in all my years of coaching, no one's ever taken hits like your kid. I mean, just got killed. It's like getting hit by a car. <laughs> and, and I had to shake my head. So my wife would always follow the ball. And uh-huh. we'd sit next to each other in the crowd. And he'd throw a you know sixty yard touchdown pass, and she's clapping, and I'd just be smacking her leg like your son's not getting up, right. you know. You understand? And then he would get up and then back out there, never missed a play. But shit, did he get the crap knocked out of yeah. him to the point where I was so glad he was able to walk away. My younger one was able to walk away, but I'm, I'm worried about the younger one now. Is he, as you said, with the head? You know, is is he going to be all right? Will he bounce back? So when I have grandkids one day. I'm definitely gonna push them away from the sport. Yeah. yeah, I want nothing, nothing to do with it. And I, and I, I hate saying that because it gave me so much. Yeah, and uh, you know, I learned so much from playing the sport. But I think that they can get that from other sports as well. Um, I think we can push them into, you know, I, and I want to teach, teach my kids about nutrition more than I ever understood. Exactly. Because God, man, when I was growing up, it was like eat as much as you can, get as big as you can. Even when I went to K- Kansas State. I mean, we had Chef Bob, so the guys that are listening in Kansas don't know who he is. But, I mean, he would make us dinners, and it was like, put as much ranch on it as you can, put as much cheese and fat and everything, and you just take big, huge plates home with you. Um, Now, they're actually, when I went back to Kansas State, a few years ago, they have nutritionists. They, they're they teaching kids about, and they, they check their weights. You're on this. This is your plan. This is what you can choose from today. And it's so important to know what you're putting into your body because I have, you know, I have issues with my weight. Yeah. And it's like, uh, as of right now, I'm down 70 pounds from where I was eight months ago, but it's still like a, a thing, man. If I would have just known, like, stop 
taking in so many sugars. Yeah. You know, do a little bit of intermittent fasting. You don't need to eat five meals a day, six meals a day. You can do certain things. It's so important in your body recovers. My cognitive thinking's ten times better than it was last year just from changing my diet. Yeah. You know, it's in so I just want to make sure that I'm teaching my kids those things and then sports can instill their work ethic and we can they can work hard, but it doesn't have to be football because I don't need them banging their head against the fucking yeah, it, it, it is changing. It's uh, not only the body types of the NFL changing in college because you see more guys looking like basketball players, you know, a wingspan lean, and everything yeah. else, a tall lean, everything else that goes into it. Alabama, and I know Ohio State's going to get it, and Oregon's going to have it very soon. They just finished a 5,000-square-foot nutrition facility. Yep. I mean, and it, it was insane when my son was there just two years ago. I can't imagine that, that it's any different, but it's, you're, right, you're right. Chefs nonstop, constantly wingy every single day, right. and it's, it's always how fast can you be at your biggest point is kind of what they're trying to get. But if it starts slowing you down, but you're right. Sugars are, are the worst thing for you, as, yeah. as, as, as you guys know. As you say to about your kids, what do they say? It's like putting salt on a snail, yeah. you know, for your muscles. It's sugar is the, the worst thing. When you put sugar in your gas tank, you hear all the time. Don't right. put it in your body. You know, it's it's the worst thing for you. I know. I, I'm I'm happy that I started to understand when I was 34 instead of being when I was 50. You yeah. know, and and being able to make those decisions. And don't kid yourself. You're addicted to sugar. Yeah. I mean, I, I oh, didn't yeah. think I was. I am. And then having those cravings and those things, and it's like, man, I'll, I'll just have one bite of this. And then it's like, before you know you eat the whole thing. It's, I mean, I was 100% addicted to sugar. Yeah. And, and it wasn't in sugar sugar in the sense of like having a candy bar, because it's in everything else. It's in your breads. It's yeah. in, I mean, you look at any fucking container, and yeah. it's got sugar in it. Yeah. You yeah. know, and it's, it's, it's crazy that it's everywhere. Yeah. Everywhere. So try to stay away from the refined sugar if you can. Yeah, I mean goes back i mean just by doing this podcast it's forced me to do things differently in my life and finally you know working next to derek and having somebody to push me to something that i'm uncomfortable with like working out but i've pushed him you know i've pushed him to do things like why the fuck are we podcasting yes. well, we're podcasting because <laughs> <Yeah, fuck this. laughs> we're podcasting because it's given us an opportunity to talk about things that are important to us to yeah. our business but not just to our business to life because as much as we want to compartmentalize life, really the more that we talk about being a dad and being who we are trying to be for yeah. our community and giving back and all the things that actually, I mean, if it wasn't for youth sports charity, we wouldn't have, I wouldn't even know Derek. Right. I mean, oh, wow. I, I came over and asked him to be a sponsor for our amateur barbecue contest. That contest was to raise money for youth sports. Yeah. And now here we are fucking 10 years later and he's got me doing mixed martial arts that's amazing <laughs> that's amazing but tell us uh how about the charities you know about really what's coming up on august 1st and how it all came to be you know what we it's funny this kind of has taken it's almost like a 10 year span to us to get to where we are i think told jeff and i were kind of on the same page and i mean 10 years meaning jeff's kids are now 10 years old he didn't see the world, I think, maybe the same way that I, that I was seeing the world when my kids were younger. My, my kids now are 24, 19 years old. And even though I had mine extremely young, 22, I had mine. He had his at, at yeah. 40. So for me, I remember I was driving back from from Los Angeles one day with, with my family in the car. And I was like, you know, there's more we can do. We got a microphone. We have a platform. There's more that we can do. And now it seems like... People are so sensitive, especially if you say something you don't agree with, well, get off your high horse just because you have a microphone. You see people just get killed on, right. on Twitter all the time because of, of politics. And I said to Jeff, when we were at, at ESPN 800 in 2004, we said, let's do a segment called Difference Makers, meaning let's, let's find somebody that's doing something good and let's point it out. And it doesn't have to be local. It can be national. But we're going to try and read a story on Friday night, Fridays. Our show was in the afternoons 1 to 4 at the time. And before we get up there, we're going to do a thing called Difference Makers. And at the time, I was volunteering Little League, Little League boards. I was coaching a lot. I coached 42 Little League teams. What? You know, I did. I, I, think, I, I, think, I think I hold, not at the same time, but I think I, I think I hold the record at East Lake Little League for coaching the, the most teams. 40, 42 teams. I Holy just did, shit. I just did T-ball and, and so, yeah. this year. Oh, T-ball for the worst. It gets better. It's like hurting cats. Yes, it is. <laughs> it is. And you're like, what do you mean? They got a bat again? You're like, just get the fuck out of here. Yeah, no, it's it, T-ball is terrible. But it's, uh, it's, it's, it's funny. Like I said, I love baseball. Right. So 
Adrian well, Gonzalez, right through East yeah, Lake. Yeah, Adrian Gonzalez. Adrian's brother lives right behind me right now. Okay. Edgar, you know, and and just great family. But yeah. you're right, East Lake High School. I played uh, against him in high school. He played against uh, Adrian. Mm-hmm. Oh, good. In Monte Vista, yeah. Yeah. So uh, Adrian was ridiculous. I mean, number one overall pick in Jesus. the draft was just insane. Yeah. So um, I try to volunteer because my dad wasn't a guy that volunteered. My dad was the guy that dropped you off and then would pick you up when the practice or game was over. Like never came to a game, never came to practice. And I said, I just want to be the opposite of that. I just want to be the guy that tries to give back as much as I can, be around my kids as much as I can. And I, I never yelled at a player, you know, but I've yelled at my own kids, even though they didn't screw up. But it was to get make the point to the other kids. Like I would say, I'm I'm talking to you, to them through you. Yeah. And they would understand. And, it, you know, they go, Jesus, Dad, I'm the best player on the team. What are you yelling at me for? You know, and. And I would say, you don't understand. I'm trying to say, I'm really serious about it. If I can get mad at you right here, that means I'm serious about this is what we need to do. Safety first, have fun. Um, as much as we won through Little League and, and travel ball stuff that we do, it was, for me, the, the biggest thing was championships are great. But if I could get that list of everyone who signed up the next year and see everybody I coach signed up again the next year, it means they had a good time. Right. So I would tell people, I go, we're creating good childhood memories. Right. You know, these games aren't on Sports Center. These games aren't. Aren't going Dude. anywhere, and and for that's me, I great, said that's a great way to look at it's, it. It is childhood, it's childhood memories. Here, here's what's interesting about baseball because you said you want to get your son, and I know you, your son will play baseball too, Sean. Yeah. Is every kid I ever send to college? I've sent had tons of kids who played for me. I've gone to college. I have five that are with major league teams right now. But every time they go to college, every kid tells me they hate it. Yeah. They fucking hate it. They hate every school I send them to, and it's because the coaches talk to them like they're in the Marines. Right. And in baseball, you play this game best when you're relaxed. And so they want you to play like Derek Jeter, but the coaches won't coach like Joe Torre. You never see, you know what I mean? You never sure. seen Joe yeah. Torre no, rip into these guys. Yeah. I understand in football when you're going to yell, yell at a guy. And over and over again, you hear, you know, some guys you got to kick in the ass, some you got to pat on the back. I've realized in baseball, you've got to pat them all on the back. It's not, it's not kicked them in the ass. Nobody feels worse than the kid that struck out or the kid that made an error. No one's ever done that on purpose. And yeah, you don't got to get mad at me for, th- for striking out. Yeah. Because yeah. I'm already throwing my yeah. fucking helmet. I was, I was already pissed. Yeah, yeah you're already pissed. Yeah. So it's like, dude, what are you telling 100%. me that I don't know? I won't be able to recover and get back and get a hit the next time because right. now, now you're making me feel worse than, than I am. No one does that on purpose. So um, the whole idea was, hey, we're creating good childhood memories. We're going to do the best we can. We're, we're going to try and win and, and and get ready to go. As you said, your, your son at uh, four years old. Here's yeah. what cracks him up about coaching at that age. <laughs> Is you'll get coaches that will sit there and have kids stretch for forty minutes, and I'm like forty minutes. I go, tell me the last time you saw a four year old to a twelve year old go up to a kid do anything for forty minutes. Yeah. Well, it, it, when's the last time you saw a kid do this move? Tag you're it, and the kid that's chasing him blow a hamstring. It doesn't happen. You don't right. need to stretch. These kids are ready to go. Right. They don't need to stretch. They just want to play. They go to school. They do. They have to clean their room. They have to do shit. Right. This is their their escape. Yeah. Just have yeah. a good time, man. You're creating. Good childhood memories. You know what's yeah. funny? I've, I've, I've fired almost every assistant coach I've ever had because they couldn't do what I asked them to do. Yeah. Just be as nice as you can be to these guys. Teach them as you're doing it and make them have fun. And if they leave here and they aren't having a good time, we're doing it wrong. We we make sure that we play tag. Yeah. And that's like when we're done with the games, like we go out and then like me and the my other coach will like run. Yeah. And because they're playing tag, they're not listening. And they're like, you know, you're at, I'm like, hey, let's see who can get coach. Then that gets them yeah. all together, and you know we're having fun and talk about stretching for forty minutes. We go out and we do jumping jacks, mm-hmm. like we do, fu- like just. Yeah. And it's not about yeah. them stretching out or anything. It's just about them. Okay, Wake get in the body. mindset to listen. Yeah. yeah, you have to listen to what we're saying. Okay, let's do jumping jacks. Okay, now let's go have fun. Yeah. yeah, and getting back to your point about your creating memories. Yeah, I was fortunate to play in every level of sports, from you know little league to pro pro sports. Yeah. The most fun I ever had was those years in the little league. The you know, where yeah. like it's never on TV. It's but having some big league chew, having some nachos yeah. going down your face. Yeah. Uh, opening day, doing a home run derby when you're you know the the twelve yeah. year old hitting like those those are the coolest days you're gonna. So do not you know discredit those and don't be getting mad at your your kids for for uh, you know goofing off and being a kid. It's something that I've had to work on. You know, yeah. me and my wife have been talking a lot about it lately, and it's positive parenting because I, I've been so coached by a lot of militant coaches like Coach Snyder in, at, yeah. at K State, and um, you know Marty Schottenheimer wasn't that way at all. But it was. It's very important, like that. I make sure I realize I despised Coach Snyder, yeah, and I loved Marty, yeah, and why am I not doing more of a Marty approach with my kids and, you know, having unrealistic expectations for a four-year-old. I need to make sure like I'm telling them 
great job for all the things yeah. he, the good things he's doing and not worrying about so much on the negative and like no oh, you have to do this like look he's fucking four years old create those memories yeah. have fun with it but it's it's truly the best times in your life and you have to like not worry like i, I don't i catch myself sometimes thinking man when he's 12 years old i can't wait well, yeah don't worry about give that. it time yeah, yeah. Let, let's let's yeah, enjoy enjoy the, enjoy the four-year-old right now uh, absolutely enjoy them my wife said this to me help me out in coaching um one issue goes, say whatever you need to say to your team within 40 seconds because you're going to lose them. Mm-hmm. After 40 seconds, they're going to start picking grass. I don't give a shit. That's great. You see coaches will sit out there for 30 minutes. Two is she, she's a head of child development for a school district. She says, I've read 600 books on how to communicate with kids. Not one of them says you get what you want out of a kid through negative reinforcement. Mm-hmm. Everything's positive reinforcement. You know, So you can't say you suck. Right. You can't say you're the worst I've ever seen. You can't say shit like that. And so when I say the college guys in, in baseball are doing it wrong, every kid I've sent to, you know, UCLA, USC, I'm talking major schools, pack, pack, 12 schools. Every kid I've ever sent away says, man, it's not the way it was. My son, before he was a college football player, was a college baseball player, mm-hmm. quit college baseball because he hated the way he was being talked to. But when he went to play for Nick Saban, he understood the difference. And Nick Saban was a tough guy. But he goes, I learned I learned a life lesson every single day from Nick Saban. If yeah. I would have taken notes every day he spoke, I could have written three books on sure. Nick Saban. He goes, I love the experience. It was for baseball. I tell kids now, if you have an offer to go pro, go pro. Yeah. Just go take it because they don't talk to you like that in the pros. And they'll let you play the game you can play. You can play or you can't. And then you write in your, your agreement with the pro teams, pay for my school, any school I qualify for 25 years after my la- – within 25 years of my last game, and they will. They'll give you 100% scholarship. Yeah, they my- don't give you 100% scholarships if you go to San Diego State, you're the number one player. They have 35 guys on a team, and they only have 11 scholarships to offer, so it's all cut up in pieces. Yeah. My best friend, he uh, played at Monta Vista, then he got a full ride to um, USC. Well, not a full ride because they didn't give full Nobody rides full ride. to only left-handed pitchers. Yeah. The- and then, But they told them if they ever give anybody – a higher scholarship than him that's not a left-handed pitcher they'll match his so i think he ended up with like a 98 percent. that's really high scholarship. think about it that's that's one guy that gets you know all of them yeah i mean so how much are you giving to the rest of the guys yeah they're, they're, that's they're, what i'm saying much. so usually he, when parents say i get 100 percent, they're either lying to you or or something's fishy where they'll give yeah. you 100 for the first year and all of a sudden they have you now right so uh, hey, second year, remember that 98%? Well, now we're going to give you a 3% yeah. because they know you can't go. Yeah. You're stuck. So he ended up getting drafted by the Blue Jays, yeah. and he played for five years, And but he put it in his contract. It was actually only five years instead yeah. of 25. So 25 is probably a lot better deal for, for these guys that are negotiating. But it was <clears throat> within five years of you being with your affiliated team, they'll pay for the rest of his college because yeah. he left as a junior yeah. in college because he don't want to leave as a senior because you have no stock. Um, so he left as a junior, played his five years, and then like three years after he was done, went back to USC, got his uh, yeah. a, a minor in economics and a major in business, I think, and they paid for the whole 100% thing. hundred percent of it. Yeah. Paid for every single yeah. thing. And it was, I mean, but you have to do those things. You have to think that way. And I know he was always saying he wishes he would have just gone pro right away because he got drafted in the third round out of high school yeah. and he turned it down to go to USC. And he's like, man, I probably should have just gone. Yeah, should have gone. Because pro gone teams right don't away. want to see you blow your arm, wear your arm out, I should say, on a college level. Yeah, yeah. Not as a pitcher. Yeah. While, while we're talking about baseball, obviously we do want to f- talk about August 1st, but what are you doing for Little Leagues? Uh, for Little Leagues coming up, this will be our next thing after August 1st, is we're going to try and find a field in San Diego. We're going to fix it. We want to We want to fix it. We want to basically put new dirt in. If You're it's finding a, the shittiest a, field in San Diego. We're trying to find a, a bad field. But uh, not only are we trying to find a really bad field in San Diego – we want one that they're going to maintain it. We don't want to do one of those ways. It's going to look great for three months, come back, and the grass is high and the dirt shitty, and nobody drags the field. Nobody's kept the pitcher's mound up. It's, it's hard to keep a baseball field Dude, going. Dude, it's insane. We're it doing is. it, like, like I said, just yeah. in, in the T-ball right now. Like, yeah. The times that we spent after, and we're dragging, we're pulling those weeds, and we're creating a line. Yeah, it's, sorry. It, no, no, no problem. It, yeah. it is. It, it's a lot of work to, to do it. Mm-hmm. And so... A few years ago when I was I was coaching at Eastlake Little League, Luke Yoder, who was the guy in charge of the field at Petco Park, came out and he showed everyone, this is how you build a mound. And it took four and a half hours to do it. And wow. he built the mound for us. And he sh- all the coaches are there watching. This is how I maintain it. And you know what? It lasted the whole year. And he did a good job. He did a good job teaching. And I'd go out there a Friday night and I would make sure everything was ready to go, that mound again. And then I'd go out and it lasted the whole you know, Saturday is you have uh, 10 teams playing. 
and then I'd go out there Sunday night, I'd do it again, it would last the entire week, and then I'd do it again on Friday. But it, it worked out fantastic. And I remember, uh, it's funny, the, probably the best kid to come off that, that mound that worked on it as a 10-year-old was Grant Holman. I don't know if you guys know Grant Holman. He was one of the Little League heroes that you okay. saw. For his like, big tall pitcher. Yeah, yeah. For, for, for East Lake. And then he's uh, he was third ranked third uh, best player in the state a year ago as a junior. He's going to Cal. And he got, got a chance to, to develop his skills pitching off the field that That's Luke cool. Yoder really developed cool. for. So we're trying to do the same thing for someone else. Right. But it has to be a community that, hey, we're going to show you. Um, we're going to put new fencing in. We're going to put new dirt in. We're going to show you how to take care of it and maintain it. But if you don't, it's going to let us all down because a lot of people are volunteering a lot of money and a lot of time to do right. it. How are sponsorships different in podcasting as opposed to how they were when you were working on radio? Well, they're more for us. It's more hands on where we get the chance to know these guys. So anyone who has who has come on as a sponsor for us, we've become very good friends. I know like, a lot of them have come into your pop, restaurant. You know, pop, Papa Bar. Yes, absolutely. Ryan Barkley was the first guy you know to come in. And, Brian and, Curry and, and, and Brian Curry has been fantastic as well. Daniel Tyler from San Diego Spirit Fence. Alan Taylor from Taylor Made Pools. They, these guys have been outstanding people in the community, been in business for 25 to 35 years that have done such a great job. But we've had a chance to develop you know, a friendship, a relationship with these guys where Jeff and I would always offer every radio station we went to, let us go out and get the deal done ourselves. You guys take credit for the sale, but we want to let them know that we're in, we're partners in this. We want to mm-hmm. sell your boots. We want to sell your sandwiches. We want to... And no, 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 we got it. We got it. And, and it was crazy. But we did yeah. develop good relationships when they let us do it with the boot world or subway at the time. And right. then all of a sudden, no, no, we don't need you guys. You know, sleep train, all those things that everything we got a chance to touch. It was different when you're reading a commercial, not just some guy that you never met. You know, yeah. it was it was that that relationship that you go. It's, it's a family and it's sure. a family type atmosphere. So we absolutely love it. We have a couple more sponsors that are will be joining us in, in August as well. And we're looking forward to having them also. But the guys we've had have been great, and that's where podcasting compared to radio, we never got a chance to, to basically have that relationship. We're just we're just reading copy, you know. Mm-hmm. Hey, you got to read this copy once an hour. And you weren't probably in, in the decision making, right? No, not in the decision that, making. We got a chance to turn things down. There's sure. certain things we wouldn't we wouldn't advertise. I know bosses don't like that. Money is money, but we weren't going to do a low T commercial. We weren't going to do yeah. that shit. You know, right. we weren't going to do it because a guy like Mike Costa, who's, who's a close friend of mine, he would read a low T commercial, and then every time. He was walking around. Someone would yell something at him. You know, they heckle him. And it was, it was, it was one of the things that was embarrassing. And he's like, Jesus, man, with my wife and kids, are you going to sit there and heckle me? It's, uh, but Jeff and I are like, we aren't doing that. We also didn't want to do commercials for um, people that promise surgeries or stuff like that. Because if you had a bad experience, hey, guess what? I can't see anymore because you told me to go to this guy. That, sure. that, that kind of deal. And, and so we, we got a chance to turn things down. Bosses don't like when you turn things down. But we're like, this is our, our name and our, our voice with it. This yeah. is all we have. We don't want someone to have a bad medical experience. That right. was kind of it. What's the difference now owning the content? Like you own it, you produce it. Like it's, it's us. Yeah, this is us. It, it's people always wonder what is the, what's the real person like? What's the real personality like? This is what we get a chance to do. We aren't really interrupted because of the commercials. We kind of run it through, run the commercials kind of towards the end, and then we'll come back with more content. But if we we're into something that's good, we don't stop every ten minutes and then read you know seven commercials. It's right. it's not like that. We get a chance to go through. Jeff has no idea how long our show's going. I'm the only guy that has the clock in front of me. So go, how long did we go? And I'll say, hey, you went an hour and a half. You went two hours and 15 minutes. He's always shocked, you know, how long we went. We just fall into a groove. The content on our podcast, and for you guys, might be the same thing. It's kind of like our phone calls. Like yeah. when he calls me, you know, on the way to work in the, in the morning in his other job, it's it's the same thing. We just now put it on on the podcast. But it's it's different things. Yesterday's show that we did was started off with, and we have, he has no idea what direction I'm going. I have no idea <laughs> <laughs> what is it? We never put anything out there. Whereas at 1360, they put us on a thing called Google Docs. And we had to write out three hours of the show. Really? It sucked. And so the boss wanted to know that we put time into it. So we would do the show till 10 o'clock in the morning or 9 o'clock in the morning. We'd get home around 11, have a few hours off. And then we would agree at 7 o'clock at night, we would start writing another three hours. And we tried doing that every damn day. It, it, it's it's just ridiculous to have it kind of scripted. Because sure. the boss wanted to be able to turn the radio on at 8.15 and know exactly where we were and he could follow along to make sure that we didn't have acid. I said, look. That's not an interview, though. No. It's not I, a conversation. I, I, no, it wasn't, wasn't, wasn't fun. It wasn't yeah. what we wanted to do. So now we started the show yesterday with you know high school memories and yeah. trying to get laid. And it was, right. it was it turned into a funny conversation. Then it turned into a dare Jeff, you know, can you, can you call Coach Quintera on the Padre <laughs> Postgame show? 
as Coach Kintera and see if he notices that you're imp- impersonating him. And he goes, oh, no, he won't know. He won't figure it out. So I told old uh, Dog Daredom, you know, to, to do it. And, and we'll see if Jeff follows through on it. But it, everything goes a different direction. And we talk sports when we need to talk sports. We, uh, you, you, we, you, you book people like Lisa Ann? Yeah, Lisa Ann, which was... So t- tell us a little bit about okay. that. So Lisa Ann, I and mean, most people know who she is. She's the, I, have no idea. I have no <laughs> idea who she is. I have no idea what you're talking your, about. Your search history says otherwise. Yeah. Yeah. Lisa Ann is the Tom Brady of the porn industry. <laughs> you know, so she's the most famous person going. So a couple of years ago, Jeff and I were in San Francisco for the Panthers Broncos Super Bowl. And Lisa Ann is doing a show for Sirius uh, NFL Radio right behind us. She does fantasy football. And so I said... Shit, I'm gonna get a picture of Lisa, and I take off, man. As soon as our show ends, I, <laughs> boom, and I come back to show Jeff. He's like, "What the fuck's wrong with you?" You know. <laughs> but I guarantee this part of Jeff going, "Man, I wish I had that picture." Right. So, um, I, I was so, and it's funny. I don't get nervous ever. I mean, there, it, it's to the point where I've met all my heroes. Yeah. You know? I've been, I had a, day to, a chance to spend a day with Michael Jordan. I've been around oh, Jordan fine. like seven Jeez. different times, and Steve Garvey was my favorite as a kid. I've been around Steve Garvey ten times, and it, nobody makes me nervous. I was so fucking nervous. She didn't even hold the phone. Like, she had to get to the well, camera. Lot, she had to do it all for me. had a lot of sexual me. relations with her, and she never knew. <laughs> so it was just an awkward... It's an awkward... Uh, and then I've been awkward. with Lisa Ann more than I've been with my yeah. wife. And so, it was, it, was, it was crazy. So, I reached out to her, and I said, Hey, what about coming on? And, man, she said, absolutely. And she came on, and not only did she come on for over an hour with us, she said, this might be the best interview I've ever done. Really, and it was it was it was really to me the interview was really good. It wasn't a bunch of you know how many guys have you done at one time. It wasn't that kind of shit. Right. It was more about her. How did she get in the business? Her as a person, she loved it. She retweeted it over and over again. She sent it out to a bunch of people. I think the line that got her that Jeff brought to her that made her more real was that she wrote in her book. Everybody wants to be with me. Nobody wants to be with me. You know, and basically everyone wants to see what it's like to sleep with me, but right. nobody wants a relationship with me. Right. And kind of like there's a, a loneliness there. Well, there, yeah, she's being vulnerable. Yeah. She's and the- when that when he hit her with it, he, she even called him back and said, you know, I've been thinking about that a lot. Mm-hmm. And that affected her as a person. Once she did that, she was different. She yeah. was she was the, the person you care about down the street. Mm-hmm. You know, not one of those, hey, she's going to come to town and we're going to chance to be with her. It wasn't that. It was like, hey, this girl's now, uh, she showed... She's vulnerable and she's a friend, you know, she, sure. she's and it's uh, the kind of kind of crazy, as he said, from went from a few years ago to God dang, this is my favorite person to watch on film to all of a sudden she's a friend of ours is is, is different. So she's been great. There's a whole running joke with Nicole Eggert, you yeah. know, who became a friend that <laughs> Sean's allowing <laughs> Jeff. No, Jeff used to tease me about this all the time. But when I was in high school going to school in LA, we used to go see free television shows all the time because every, any show you want to see is, is in front of a studio audience. If it's a comedy and you just go and you grab a free ticket at the mall and then you, you walk in and you see it. So like, if you want to see big bang theory, your wife's a fan of the show, whatever you say, Hey, I'm going to get tickets. We'll go see it for free. Just like you see Jimmy Kimmel or any of those other guys. So I would always go see the show Charles in charge. Not because I love the show, but I love Nicole Eggert. I had a biggest crush on Nicole Eggert. <laughs> and I would go over and over again. And Jeff, Jeff says to me, just casually, he doesn't know the story. And he, this is right when we first started. He goes, how often did you go to the show? I go, I went every Thursday. He goes, every Thursday. And he, I, he goes, well, how many, how many times? I got like 22 weeks in a row. And he's like, holy shit, you're a stalker. And not only would I not just go, but I would talk to her. Right. And I'd bring her, or bring her a rose and the whole deal. And, how old were you? Uh, this is two weeks ago. No, no, this is, I was 17, 18 years old. Okay. And so Jeff would uh, go, holy shit, you fucking freak. You know? And, right. and then I was like, no, no. And then the more he, he would say it, I was like, geez, dude, I did sound kind of scary. And then we tracked her down and we got her on. And she, she remembered the whole thing and really? the whole deal and how serious I was at that time and how serious she was not was, <laughs> was kind of, was kind of crazy. And I was so sure she was going to call me and say, we're going to go out. Never happened that I went to go see the TV show Meredith Children. Remember that show? Of course. Hundred percent. During Meredith Children, as I'm watching that show, not trying to pick up anybody, just watching the show because I love the show. Christina Applegate asked me out. She says, Hey, let's go out. And just right between as they're changing from like the, the living room to the shoe store scene. And she comes into the crowd and asks, man, oh, no, 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 I, I, I can't. I was waiting for Nicole Eggert to fucking call. I never called. <laughs> I never went out with Christine Alphagate, but I had an opportunity. I completely blew it. 
Man. And so Nicole Eggert's become a, a friend of the show. And so isn't that crazy? It is. Crazy I mean, it's shit. like podcasting has it, yeah, it breaks it breaks down these barriers. Our boss, these oh Rachel shit, would never moments, let us have right? them on. Ever. Why would you ever contact them? Yes, but you're like, fuck it, I'm going to go and do that. And, and our when you do that, you would never let us. And then you talk about your vulnerabilities, yeah. being young and having a crush, and yeah. people are like, shit, I was young, I had a crush. Like, fuck, yeah. thanks for sharing that. Yeah. I would fucking laugh, laugh my ass yeah. off. <laughs> you know what's right? You know what's cr- crazy about here, here, by the way, the next one I'm chasing. And I've told Jeff, I said, <laughs> and this isn't because I have a crush, but it, because of this whole LeBron deal. And she, for some reason, we're friends on social media. Uh-huh. I don't know why she reached out to me. She followed me first. And then all of a sudden, we we like communicate with each other. Is Paula Abdul. Really? I said, I'm going to try, yeah. try and grab Paula Abdul. And I said, yeah. that's the next one we're, we're chasing is going to be if I can get Paula Abdul to come on. It's but a big deal. It, it's kind of crazy. The I- interesting thing in in my life is I was saying to my, to my son just a couple months ago, I go, you know what's really weird? I go, I've had a chance in my lifetime to meet everybody I've ever wanted to meet, which is strange. How many people get that opportunity? You know, I've met every sports hero that I ever wanted to meet. You know, I was a big Magic Johnson fan. I've met Magic Johnson. You know, Kobe, I knew before Kobe was a star. I was just there when he That's came, crazy. To the, came to the Lakers. Shaq's, Shaq's been great. Funny story with uh, Shaq, so funny. With Shaq is I brought my niece down to the sports arena where the Lakers played that preseason game. And I had a, had my niece, who was good looking at the time, to say, and she's still good looking, I shouldn't say that, but she's like 22. Mm-hmm. And I had her hold a microphone and a tape recorder and say, Hey, when I'm in San Diego, I listen to the Dave and Jeff show. We could use them as rejoiners. So I said, I get to get one from Shaq. He's like the biggest star in the league. And she goes and she does it. And then he asks her out and she panics. Instead of giving her him her number, she gives him my number. <laughs> And so all of a sudden, Shaq's calling me like four days in a row, dude, in the middle of the night. And I'm like, shit. My wife's like, who's calling you at three in the morning? It's fucking Shaq. Yeah, don't worry, babe. It's yeah. just she's killing you. So I go to cover another Laker game like a week later at Staples. And all of a sudden, I'm talking to somebody. And my, my neck's about 18, 18, 18 and a half inches around. Pretty big neck. Yeah. Shaq puts his entire fucking hand around my neck. Like, closes his fingers <laughs> on it and goes, hey, brother, where's that girl I was talking to a couple weeks ago? And I'm like, oh, shit. Oh, shit. Yeah, so now he wants to know where she is because he knew she worked with me. Right. And I'm like, holy shit. And no Shaq, way. Shaq called for a long time. Like a wow. year, Shaq would call looking for her. Nonstop calling my phone. <laughs> it was crazy as hell. Poor guy. I'd but, be scared as fuck. That's so that, funny. Uh, yeah. But the opportunity's been been cool. Jeff and I went and saw Howard Stern uh, when he was doing uh, you know America's Got Talent. That was like the last one on my list. But otherwise, it's been, we've been pretty lucky with this microphone and the opportunity of getting guys on. Um, I had a conversation with Michael Jordan once about um, saying to him, you have a pretty cool life. I've never seen so many people interested in one person in my life. And he goes, it's not what you think. And he goes, I'll tell you what, next time I come to town, you spend a day with me and I'll, you get to a chance to be Michael Jordan. And so from 10 in the morning to 11 o'clock at night, I did nothing but hang out with Michael Jordan to see wow. what it was like. And I know, obviously, Sean, you're great friends with Jim Trotter. Yeah. Jim had one of the best jobs I've ever heard. He got to follow, follow Michael around for three weeks to see what it was like. Unbelievable. To be Michael, three weeks when he covered the NBA for the UT. And it's a very, very unusual guy. And he's different than anyone I've ever met. What I mean by that is... I'm not the most religious guy in the world, but when you look at Michael Jordan in person and you watch him, it's like there's a light on him. He is different than, like, he's made different than anyone I've ever seen. You, he's a magnet. You cannot take your attention off Michael Jordan the whole time you're with him. He's, he's an interesting guy. And Tony was a great guy, and Tiger Woods is a dick and all that stuff. And <laughs> I've been around all those guys. Michael Jordan is different than any person I've ever met on the planet. Yeah, I think it's hard to for people to, to realize a lot of these people are just people. Yeah, they and, are. They're and, just people. People... Like that, you know, I've been fortunate to be around some guys and it's once you break down that barrier, like you were talking about, you can't call them Mr. Whatever, yeah. you know, like uh, you just call them. You got to be on their level. Once you talk to them, they're just fucking people, man. They just they put have you ever been around them. anyone like that? You've been around a lot of superstars. You ever been around someone like that where you go, man, that guy's different than anyone I've ever met? Uh, no, nah, not 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 per se. I mean, I would say like. Because I know him so well and done so many things with him, but Darren Sproles yeah, is just a guy. different person, yeah. and he has a speech impediment, yeah. so he stutters. And but you know, when him and I are around each other. We've known each other for yeah. since we went to college together. Yeah. So since we were eighteen, and so but he, the way he does things and approaches things, and it, it's just different. Yeah. You know, uh, my best friend, you know, the same thing. Like when he played baseball and, and would hit the ball, it was just different. Yeah. But I never, no one that had just had that aura. I, I'd love to fucking hang out with Michael, though. Check yeah. that out. But he's, I, he's the only guy I've ever seen like that. And yeah. again, I've been a huge Magic Johnson fan. Magic didn't have that. Right. You know, he's the only guy just I've ever seen like that. It's just something, something different. Yeah. It was, I, can't, I can't explain it. Yeah. 
you know, very, very different. But it, as I said, it's been, uh, it's been a great opportunity. This microphone has opened up so many, you know, doors for us. You know, Jeff and I hopefully will continue this another 20 years. And right. podcasts, I think, is going to continue to blow up to the point where if I owned a radio station, I'd be freaking out. Yeah, Dude, you, know? you, ha- you have to be freaking out because it's so easy to find whatever content you want. And you don't have to just, think, you know, on the radio it doesn't always feel authentic. Yeah. We're now like these people are passionate. If you want to fucking find out about yeah. uh, a podcast about not eating sugar, go fucking look it up. You'll find one. And that person's going to be passionate about whether it's Robert Wolf, wh- whoever it is talking about it. It's going to be exactly what you want. The content's there to, to listen to. So it's uh, it's cool. It's exciting. And, and, and it's I, on I demand. It. Yeah. I mean, I well, listen to fucking Dave and Jeff yeah. podcast on the plane in Sofia. Right. Like I didn't have to fucking get the mighty 1090 signal. Yeah. Like I listened to it on demand when I wanted to listen to it. Yeah. That's, that's the, the craziest thing. Also, I, n- I don't want to be the get off my lawn guy ever. Yeah. You know, I was tease Nick Canepa, who's the greatest <laughs> guy in the world, but I, I like, I still get the paper just for Sundays to see what the fuck is Nick going to say where I'm going to go. What are you talking about? Right. Yeah. How can you tell me the 73 Knicks are the greatest basketball team you've ever seen? Get off. You know, he's, he's the ultimate get off my lawn guy. I don't want to be that guy. That's why, I always ask my kids, what's going on? What are you listening to? What are you watching? You know what my, my kids and their friends do? They never watch TV like we used to watch TV. Yep. They never go 8 o'clock on Thursdays is Big Bang Theory. They don't do that. Everything's yep. on demand. None of those guys you know, have Cox Cable or Direct TV. They don't do that shit. Everything's on demand at all times. And if you can follow what the younger people are doing, they're always ahead of everybody else. You're going to be relevant, number one. Number two is you're going to know what the consumer wants. Yeah. And, and, and that's the way it goes. And... They will say, you know, ages 25 to 54 on radio, those are the ones you want because they're the ones that buy products, are the ones that buy insurance, buy cars, buy houses. That's the audience you want. Radio is in deep shit. I mean, they deep are. They're, they're in deep shit right now. And the podcasting is the way to go. Everything is in demand. You know, what I want to hear, what, what's going through my mind right now, where are my questions, what I want to be entertained by. That's the way it is. And, you, and you're able to interact. Yeah. I mean, you're able to interact with listeners in ways that you just never were able. I mean, yeah, you could call into a radio show, but yeah. not the way that you interact with uh, people that listen to your podcast. Absolutely. There are two guys in sports radio right now that move the needle. Uh, and one for Fox and one for ESPN. For Even if you might hate Stephen A. Smith, he moves the needle. When he's on TV and on radio, he moves it. Uh, Colin Coward does the same thing for Fox. But Colin Coward signed a deal with Fox that he makes $6 million a year doing his radio show. But guess what? He makes eighteen million dollars a year doing the podcast. Yep. You know the pod, and he he is shocked by it too. Here's right. a guy in his fifties that's going, "Oh my gosh, I'm glad when I sign my contract, I own my podcast rights." Hundred percent. And that's, I talk to Trotter about it yeah. all the time. I mean, yeah. those are the conversations I have. That is the most valuable asset that you can have. Yes. And that's going to be for players as well. You know, owning your content and being your own media exactly company, right. it gives you so much more opportunity. Exactly right. And so that's the, I think even to his surprise and his great agent that. Hey, I make another eighteen million a year that I wasn't even counting on because of this podcast that I knew nothing about a few years ago. Yeah, yeah. I think we Ari Siegel was on our show uh, a couple of weeks ago, and he was talking about how the younger demographic doesn't necessarily care. Everyone thinks that they're cheap and they don't buy things. It's not really true when they when they go on you know the Twitch when they're doing the esports and stuff, and it's they're finding the content they want and they're spending the money the way they want to spend it, and they don't have to be told what to do. So when they can again on demand find what they want yep. how they want it they're gonna they're gonna pay the money on whatever it is it, but it can't be force fed to them exactly no one wants to hear that shit anymore yeah you can't tell me what i have to do or what i what, I, what you think like just I'll, I'll make my decision and then it, then i feel empowered by doing that and i'll go spend the money how i want to spend the money and if you but if you can be in there and being a part of that like you said on the podcast and being on that platform it, it's just a win-win exactly right so everything we talk about today will be in the show notes. How can people find you? Uh, it's easy to find us. We're trying to put more people back to the website, but it's a Dave and Jeff show.com. Dave and Jeff show.com. Easiest way to get us. Of course, you can hear us on iTunes and SoundCloud and, and it's easy that way, but we're trying to get everything now pushed back towards the website first. So I'm going to start adding content and adding blogs in there and a reason to get you to show up to the website. Yep. And uh, we'd love to do what you guys are doing. Our next step, hopefully, is to put us on camera. Yep. And it seems like the most successful podcasts are not only the content, but people want to see what's going on. What does it look like? What are those guys doing? Whether they're even drinking water or, you know, unfortunately for me, I, I, I dip tobacco as the time I'm, yeah. I'm doing it. It's my, it's my one thing that I'm trying to stop. Um, but it's, uh, it, it's one of those things where people want to know what is the setup? What is, sure. what, what does it look like? And so you guys have the best setup I've ever seen so well, far. I, think, I mean, fantastic yeah. table. You guys have the air conditioner when it's 8 million degrees outside and absolutely beautiful. Right now we're doing it out of, out of my 
garage and I have a decent sized garage, but it's, it's not the, it's not the same thing as this. We have the, you know, a couple TVs set up and everything else, but they want to know what is the communication. It's, it's funny in, well, it's also an in-person interview. It's, it's an in-per- that, that's you're very right. important for Derek but and myself. Yeah, yeah, and that's one right. of the things like when we started, we're like, we don't really want to do the Skype interview. Yep. Yes. It's going to limit our ability to reach out to yep. people, but we'd much prefer that one-on-one conversation yep. or Absolutely. two-on-one. You're right. And I know like 1360 does Fox Sports San Diego. Well, that's edited. That's mm-hmm. cut up. There's a person. Sure. There's no a editing. Person. We don't edit shit. No, we don't edit shit either. Ever. I mean, I Jeff blew out our me. microphones yesterday, screaming <laughs> into the mic. And I was like, what happened? We just got knocked off. Did you tell Was he yelling, calm down? Yeah, he was yelling, calm down. Yelling, yelling for someone else to calm down? I, I, think he, I think he was doing an impression of the mayor of Poway and it blew it out. But I'm like, what the fuck just happened? And we were completely dead. But you know what? I could have gone back and edited in that spot where you would have never known, but I left it. Yeah. Because that, that's... It's tough. authentic, man. That's it's authentic. What the, that's people want that shit. Now, when Jeff and I used to do the radio show, people, I think that would have been interesting for people to watch. I used to say to management all the time, throw a camera in here. Let yeah. them follow online. And it ne- they never wanted to do no. that. But the, the reason I say that is Jeff and I have worked together long enough. We don't step on each other, which is always hard for people that start broadcasting. But we give signs all the time, not signs that we're trained with, just signs that we have between ourselves. Like if, if let's say we're talking to James Lofton and he's talking about his time with the Green Bay Packers. Well, I got a follow up question in my head about the Green Bay Packers, too. And I don't want him to jump to his time coaching with the Chargers mm-hmm. and then go back to the Packers. And it just sounds fucked up. Right. You want to stay on topic and we'll give each other a sign, a follow-up question sign, or I got one more quick thing to jump into that because we're trying to alternate questions. I think the hand signals would, that have been would be interesting fascinating. Cause that would be of, fa- fascinating. It's like to your watch. Navy SEAL no, signs. It, that's what yeah. Twitch is. That's why yeah. eSports because people are watching other people on their craft yes. and you're learning from the best. You guys have been doing it for a sustained amount of time yeah. and you've done it with the best. Yeah, but you've only done it because you've worked on your. We've worked on it, and we we've developed our own sign language through our hands. Of, of I usually how, just hit Sean, and so <laughs> <laughs> just punch him. And it's 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 no. What's funny is when you get a guest in. So let's say right now you guys are sitting right next to each other. Right. Let's say you have a celebrity and he's sitting right between you two. Well, the celebrities looking. Lisa, at, that's the spot for yeah. Lisa. <laughs> that's, that's it. So let's say she's looking at you, and Sean's behind now behind her back. Mm. Well, he, it's hard to give signs or to even sign that, hey, I'm done. I've nothing left to, to ask right. without offending the guest or throwing the guest off. Like, wh- what are you doing? And so they're, they're diff- there's a different way to communicate that we kind of developed. That was thought, and radio would have been really cool. But, uh, no, we're not going to throw a camera in here. We're not going to give you any reason to log into the site and but watch. You, you, you do it. You do the best you can, yeah. and you you, tr- you change it. You know, I yeah. mean, we, before we would have the guest was always looking at the TV, yeah. but it, they were actually looking at the camera. And the people were like, what the fuck is he looking at? Why the fuck do you keep looking over here? Like, uh, well, I was looking at the website that you yeah. put up on the TV and that, you know, so you radios, change and you adapt. Radios, uh, because they won't pivot, is going to be the demise. It is. It's going to be the I Toys mean, R Us. You, you know, know you have be... radio and TV overtook radio for a long time, but then they had, a, you know, they were both going. And now this thing is going to overtake everybody. Yeah. I mean, this thing, where, you know, your phone is going to do everything. It, it, so it, it is. And, and it's if not... you don't want to think about it and you don't want to be a part of it, I get it. It's hard. Change is hard for everybody. Yeah. Right. But you're going to fucking get passed up pretty quick. No, it's funny. We were watching as a family the other day. We we're watching Ferris Bueller's Day Off. My kids hadn't seen it. My wife hadn't seen it in 30 years. And I said, Dude, we'll, we'll watch it. So, one of my favorites and if you look at the dad's desk in his office there's no computer on the desk yeah you know like you know and his his day is probably dictating three letters to a secretary <laughs> and think how quickly you cannot get three emails and okay. that's his whole getting eight hours yeah and and my wife goes man i kind of miss those days i go it's never going back and never i going said back. everyone's going back to their phones and and that's that's the way it is and how can i get content faster and kids are smart man and they're they, they want it like this boom 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 yeah and that's kind of where we are right now it's it's kind of crazy and it's not going back and can you keep up the thing that we appreciate you know number one your time but the way that you guys embrace being uncomfortable and sharing and i think that's why you have such a popular podcast i think that's why all the people in the industry admire what you're doing they take courage from it hopefully they start their own podcast and um you know i know personally just listening to your guys' show helped us start this podcast so um, you know, we're, we're fortunate to have people interact with us all over the world. Um, people that own butcher shops, people that are into barbecue, that are into fire, that are in media, that love sports. Uh, you know, we we talk about barbecue, but 
a lot of times we just talk about life, yeah. you know, like we wouldn't be here with, without barbecue, yeah, but, absolutely. you know, life happens along the way. Yeah, no, 100% right. You know, it's funny, uh, and I know we're going to wrap up in a second, but I was talking to Jeff yesterday off there, and I almost wish I would have asked him on there in case people don't realize the two big life changes that happened for Jeff and I both happened in the same day. Both happened on January 1st, 2018 get a phone call that my dad passed away. Okay. On 2018 that my dad, my dad was fighting cancer for a number of years, finally couldn't take it, put a gun to his head and took his own life. And the phone rings. And I'm one of those, when you're, when you have a parent that's not doing well, you keep thinking that call is coming one day. Sure. And so my, my phone rings, it's in the other room. I can hear it. And I have uh, the thing on my, on my wrist that vibrates and I can see it's my mother. And I just said, ah, fuck it. I'm gonna let it go. And then uh, I was talking to my younger son at the time. Then all of a sudden it rings again. And I'm like, oh, shit, two times in a row. And then it rings downstairs. And it was uh, my wife saying, call your mom back immediately. And I was like, shoot, this is it. You know, you kind of had a feeling. But I, but I was thinking, he, no way he's dying of cancer. Yeah, right. I just talk, yeah, Yesterday I just talked to my mom. He just got out of the hospital. supposed to go back for another chemo thing on Tuesday. And then that was it. Life changing. Then I get a phone call two hours later before I didn't even call Jeff. Couldn't talk to anybody. And he's like. Vita and I are getting a divorce, you know, and that was a wow. So all of a sudden his family life's breaking up. My dad passes away and we're both of us are upside down. And so it changed. The question I asked Jeff yesterday, because I haven't had a friend as close as Jeff who's gone through a divorce. What's it like when you walk in the house? Like when you drop your kids off, do you guys still hug each other? Do you still give her a kiss? Do you, you know, what happens? I'm just curious to know what's the relationship. You built this up for over 10 years and now all of a sudden it, it's different. He has a great relationship with his soon to be ex wife, which is, is great to see. And his kids feel comfortable, but I'm just curious to know. I wish I would have kind of asked him more what, what's it like as you go through the stages, right. you know, because it's about to become final in six weeks, mm-hmm. you know, but it's, uh, it is, it's as real as can be. There's nothing that, that we don't hide. I, mean, on I there. think it's, you know, we, when we had a, we interviewed Scott Kaplan, you know, last year and he shared with us that he was going through a divorce and he's like, I don't, I, I, wrestle with talking about it on the radio all the time yeah and he hadn't started his podcast yeah but now that he's starting his podcast he's starting to realize that it's actually better for him to share what's happening in his life because those are the things that people people deal with shit we all deal yeah. with shit no, we deal with life everybody does it's uh it's interesting that you say that about scott because I've, I've known scott since about 2002 i didn't know him know him like friends you know but i would see scott would shake hands how you doing mm. But we didn't know each other. I think a lot of times you look at each other as as competitors. You know, a lot of guys in the radio aren't, aren't the best guys, I always say, until you establish that relationship where the ratings don't mean shit. You know, uh, Stevie Woods is a good friend. Darren Smith's a good friend. Scott Kaplan's turned into a good friend. And for me, where it changed with Kaplan was I saw him at a football game uh, last year. His son was kicking for Torrey Pines or playing San Marcos. And I ran into him at halftime, and he told me the story. Told me about what he was going through. But he said, I haven't opened it up about this to anybody. When he showed uh, that he was vulnerable at this time, and this was a huge life decision for him and his kids, it changed everything. It's like Crazy. that guy right now is, I right. consider him a close friend because of that he was willing to share he let, weakness. He let his guard down. He let his guard down. Oh. And the fact he opened up here, I'm sure helped him out too because that's a tough decision that he had to make to go, you know, I, I can't do this anymore. It's hard. And I know just a few intimate things that I've shared on air that it actually helps me. Yeah. It, as much as it might help other people and, and them understand, but sometimes me just articulating it and, and getting it out there, and you know, you almost feel like you, there's a weight lifted off you. Like I'm, mean, I, I just had to tell, yeah. you know, I had to talk about it a little bit. Like the weight problem, you know, getting up close to 400 pounds was like pretty wild. You yeah. know what I mean? I've always been strong, but it's like, but it's like okay, now now it's out there, and now I have like a little bit more to talk about, and I can I can feel comfortable, and and uh, it's it's good. It helps me grow it helped me get on on track and it's just those little things that uh being vulnerable you've always kind of been taught as a man you know you leave your vulnerability yeah. you know you're, you're a tough guy like concussions yeah dude i mean i would i would play through anything my my old college coach who's now the head guy at the 49ers was always like you're the toughest guy he's yeah. like but it's going to catch up to you he you would know, warn like, you. He yeah. would tell you. Oh, he told me wow. when I was in, at K-State. He's like, you're hands down the toughest player I've ever met. I'd break my arm, get surgeries, had surgery on my wrist. Next game, Boom. nerve block, taped up. Had, you know, and, and he's like, it's going to catch up to you, Derek. Like, yeah. you, you don't need, like, if I, we know we want you, but you don't need to do that thing. You don't you don't need to be out there playing. Um, but it was just who, who I was. But, yeah, I mean, it's... Uh, 
It's therapy. I say that all the time. Yeah, Being it, out of it really does if help. You're willing to open up. Howard Stern will probably tell you the same thing. Yeah, I mean, the, he'll say the key to his career was that. Hey, I'm just going to let everything go. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, we do want to get a social shout out every week. We give away uh, one of our mugs to a, one of our listeners that tags I love that us mug, by uh, the way. behind the day. smoke. Uh, barbecue war stories. This is going out to at Mister Caddy. Um, Jeff Bradley, this guy has been following the podcast and tagging us in his barbecue photos um, pretty much since we started. So we really appreciate that. And um, yeah, he's, he's, he was at Del Mar last year. Uh-huh. I imagine he's coming, he's to, be coming, there this coming year. again this year. Um, nice guy, Caddy Q. He's been down to been down to Cali. Yeah. Um, so we appreciate him listening to the show, and um, we're excited. Del Mar's coming up. It's excited, Del Mar's days. coming out. Thirty nine yeah. days. Uh, man, I just talked with Chevis again. Some more seafood stuff. So awesome. we're, we're we're excited to kind of implement a new new avenue for people that don't want just barbecue. We'll have some seafood there for you to try out. Turf and surf. Make sure you're there. We'll be doing a social media uh, video here soon to kind yeah. of promote it. We're going to go out to all the other pit masters that'll be there. Talk let to them, them know. Yep. You know where they can. Uh, you know, get tickets. How they can get them. And uh, we're, we're excited. So make sure you check it out. All you can eat barbecue. I mean, how can you really and go beer? Wrong? Well, it's not all you can drink beer. No, but you get beer <laughs> you included. Get beer. Yeah, you get craft beer included. Yeah. I'll be on the floor, <laughs> real quick. But yeah, make sure you guys make it out, and then we have our, our Spring Valley one. But well, we'll thank you, uh, Dave. Of for course, thanks for having uh, me, guys. I really awesome. appreciate Please it. Please check out their podcast if you want to laugh your fucking ass. Yeah, off it's amazing. And hear some real shit. Thank you. Um, we'll we'll see you guys next week. Hey guys, this is Sean and Derek, and we just really want to thank you for listening to the podcast. It means the world to us. We'd like you to go check out BehindTheSmokeMedia.com. That's our website where we have barbecue resources for you to help build your barbecue business. Uh, We also have events listed, so anything that's happening in the West Coast barbecue movement, uh, anything that's going on, we want you to go check that out so you can learn more and get involved. We also have show notes uh, from all the episodes, so anything we talked about in the episodes, you can find detailed show notes there. Um, Plus, you can just get in touch with us. It's important that uh, we're here as a resource for you, so please reach out. Let us know how Derek and I can help you with your barbecue journey. Uh, Get involved, stay curious, and uh, follow us on social at Barbecue War Stories. Uh, We'll talk to you soon.